G'day Revive family, welcome back to another CarMake Revive Drift Card video. I'm Matthew Hearn and this is my jackass. This video, we're looking at engines. More importantly, what engines are going to fit in our revived drift carts and what engine is going to suit your needs. So ladies and gentlemen, in front of me, I've got three engines here and a bunch of accessories. 125cc semi-auto, 140cc manual, and a 190cc big dog. Let's unbox the engines and have a bit of a look over them. So again, going through the engines in front of me, we've got three engines that we're gonna look at today. 125cc semi-auto four-speed, 140cc four-speed manual, and a big dog 190cc five-speed manual. So the three engines that we've got in front of us represent most of the engines that you would probably be looking at in order to you know, put an engine or a motor in our Revive Drift Cart. Now, all three of these engines are electric start. That means they have a starter motor and you're gonna require a battery. Obviously, if you wanna look for a cheaper alternative, most of these engines also come in non-electric start or kickstart. In that case, you will not need to buy a battery, but the carts will need to be push started in order to get them running. The 125cc semi-auto four-speed probably one of the cheapest entry level engines for those that are new to any kind of karting. This engine starts around $300, that is Australian. We're getting our prices off eBay. Again, no affiliation to eBay. Our, one two, our sorry, 140cc manual, it's in front of me. So neutral, first, second, third, fourth. This engine starts at around $500 mark. A little bit cheaper for non-electric start. And if you want a bunch of accessories with it, it's gonna be probably a little bit higher in price. Again, these prices are just from eBay. The 190cc on your right or my left, these are $1,000. So they're first, neutral, second, third, fourth, fifth. So they're a five-speed engine. Again, $1,000 They're at the more pointy end. So most people think, Obviously, when they're gonna buy an engine, they need the absolute most powerful engine possible. This is not the case. The 125cc in front of me, this engine here, makes 5.8 kilowatts and will do the majority of what most people want it to do. The 140cc directly in front of me makes seven kilowatts and the 190cc to my left or your right is gonna make 13 kilowatts. So it makes quite a fair bit more power. In saying that, the 190cc to my left also weighs quite a bit more, about five to seven kilos more depending on the engine. 
It's also worth having a chat about the semi-auto engine and our manual engine. Both our basic cart kit and our pro cart kit are going to accept either a semi-auto or a manual. That is, they come with a clutch pedal and a brake pedal. Some people may prefer a semi-auto and we should have a bit of a talk about the reasons why. If you know you kind of want this as a more social, you know, bit of a run around, easy to start, easy to drive, the semi-auto, obviously without a clutch pedal, for somebody who's never driven a manual, there's no need to have to worry about balancing the clutch. In saying that, all of us here at Revive generally prefer the manual engines, that is the one with a clutch pedal, as when we're generally sliding around, we will be balancing between, you know, clutch in, on the handbrake, or flaring the clutch, just to give a, you know, a bit more of aggressive feel or to catch up to that person in front of us. So, it definitely comes down to the person who's driving the car, what, you bu what you're buying it for and how you're gonna use it. So, semi-auto, no clutch pedal, manual engine in front of me, requires a clutch pedal, and obviously maybe a little bit more skill to drive it. It's worth adding a side note that each of the engines in front of me are gonna come with a bunch of accessories, some of which you're not gonna need. They all come with a kickstart. We've thrown out the kickstart as this is not gonna be uh, needed because these are all electric start. They also all come with a shift lever, intake manifold, and a couple of accessories. So a lot of these we're gonna still use in order to assemble the Revive Cart Kit. A lot of people are probably gonna decide which engine they want based on price. So, semi-auto in front of me is around the $300 mark. Again, all of these prices are just from general eBay. So semi-auto, $300. The 140cc manual, 500 to say 550. And the 190cc five-speed manual starts at about $1,000 and goes up to about $1,300. So it's $1,300. There are obviously different engines ranging in different prices. If you go for an engine of any of these kinds without electric start, it is gonna be cheaper. You don't need electric start. They can be pushed start rather easily. And again, you can save yourself a few bucks if that's what you want. Everybody out there is gonna think bigger is better. I want this engine, it makes all the kilowatts. It makes almost twice the kilowatts of what the 140cc makes, but you're gonna be a little bit wrong. If we spin these engines around and have a look at the architecture, the 190cc, it's obviously a big dog engine. It weighs a bunch more and it's quite girthy. It's not gonna fit in our revived drift cart frame. Let's have a look why. Uh, a couple of basic measurements just to explain to you why the 190cc up to say a 212 or a 220, horizontal cylinder as which these ones are, why the bigger engine is not gonna fit. So, take a quick measurement from the center line of the engine or where the engine cases come together. Spin around this way so you guys can see. If we go off to your left, this engine is 150 millimeters from the center to the outside on your left. Whereas if we go across to the 190cc, again up to a 212, and I measure from the edge, it is approximately 175 millimeters. So the 190cc on this side is an extra 25 mil or about an inch wider. This is gonna make it stick out through the frame of the engine. It's gonna actually hit where the hydraulic handbrake sits. We don't recommend that. We don't want it to get in the way. Let's have a look at the other side why it's possibly also not gonna fit. So 140cc from the center of the engine case outwards. We're gonna look and it is again, 150 millimeters from the center to the outermost edge. If we come across to the 190, got about 160 millimeters. So 140 cc from the center to the outside of the case is 150 millimeters. On the 190 cc, again up to 212 or 220 from the center of the case to the outside where our clutch pack is, is 160 millimeters. It's another 10 millimeters or almost half an inch wider on this side of the engine. These engines are gonna to be too wide for our chassis. 
So 190, 212, no go. Don't, no, 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 no bueno, no bueno. Something else that you wanna keep an eye out for, just in case you've got that mate who's got an engine tucked away in the corner of his shed or his garage or his workshop somewhere. Cylinder orientation, so this is a pit bike engine. It suits most pit bike architecture. That is where all the mounts are and how the cylinder sits. It is possible to buy a pit bike engine with a horizontal cylinder. That is a cylinder that sits up and down that engine won't work, it won't fit, won't work. The cylinder is gonna sit right between your crutch and the carby is gonna come basically back towards you into your chest, it's not gonna fit. Um, so obviously we want a motor the same or an engine the same as the one that's in front of me with a horizontal cylinder. The other thing that we wanna look for is if you buy an or you get given or you manage to purchase an electric start engine such as the one in front of me, we need to be careful where the starter orientation is. So for those people who are unsure, the starter motor is located on this engine down the bottom. If you get the motor with the starter motor on the top, the starter motor on the top is gonna to foul on the seat and get in the way of how that seat mounts on the top of the frame. So just to recap, we want a horizontal cylinder engine, such as the one in front of me, without the starter motor on the top, and if you have a starter motor, that starter motor needs to be mounted on the bottom. This engine will fit perfectly in our frame and will do everything that you need it to do. It's also worth mentioning that all of the engines that we've run in our revived drift cart chassis in the past have all been four-speed engine, so neutral, first, second, third, fourth, there may be the possibility to buy a five-speed engine. We don't recommend this. Chances are the engine casings are gonna be wider on a five-speed engine and thus not fit in our revived frame. Extra side note, we haven't spoken about a full automatic engine. None of us have ever used one. It doesn't mean that you guys out there may not want to, but um, we've never used one. We don't recommend them. Yeah. Also, quad bike engines. Uh, all of the shift mechanisms on all of your regular pit bike engines will basically, once we make the shifter, will be neutral, first, second, third, fourth, like a regular sequential. The difference to this is quad bike. Quad bike engines, sorry, I would, we don't recommend quad bike engines. All the shifting pattern on a quad bike engine is in reverse. So you'll end up having to push forward to go up gears and pull back to go down gears, which just feels weird. Just don't do it. Quad bike engines, if your mate's got a quad bike engine, he's gonna give it to you cheap, just go buy a regular pit bike engine. You'll be more than thankful later. Now that we've had a look at what engine is gonna fit in your revived drift cart chassis, we need to have a brief look through how to get fuel into that engine. In front of me here, we have two carburetor options and some accessories to go along with those. This one here is gonna be one of the more cheaper, more readily available that you'll find on eBay or any of your auction site uh, websites. These start at about $15 and go up to about $50. It'd be more of a basic entry. And on this side here, we have a more higher end. These start at about 50 to 60 dollars and go up to about 150 dollars as for what particular carburetor best suits your application at the end of the day we always recommend that you speak to a local expert have a conversation with them about what's going to suit your needs it's also worth saying that if you purchase either of the carburetors in front of me we highly recommend and as silly as it sounds that you probably buy two carburetors, at some point you're gonna find that you may have an issue and the easiest thing in the absolute minute is just swap out the carburetor and keep running. The last thing you wanna do is you've gone out for the day to have a bit of fun, the carburetor starts playing up and then you're stuck for the next couple of hours mucking around and fixing with it. Now let's get into building up the 140cc manual electric start engine that's in front of me. Let's do this. Now that you've 
had a bit of a talk to somebody, you've decided uh, whether you want a manual engine, a semi-auto or an automatic. You've also decided whether you want a electric start or a push start. You've obviously then gone out, you've bought your engine, you've got your engine in front of you. We wanna go through now how to build your engine so that it's ready to fit into your revived drift cart chassis. The first thing that you wanna do when you've removed your engine from the box is check over it, make sure that it's shipped in good condition. The next thing that we're gonna do is remove a couple of pieces, brackets, covers, in order to get the engine ready. So the first thing, on the side where the chain is, we have generally a cover that covers the stator and the engine drive sprocket. In the case of this engine, it is a two-piece side cover. We are gonna start by removing this rear cover. We've removed the rear engine cover that covers the sprocket. This is not gonna be needed when we fit it to the cart chassis so we can throw away that piece. The next thing that we wanna fit that you'll be able to see, or remove, sorry, there's a breather that runs from the crankcase rearward. We wanna cut this off so it finishes about halfway down the back of the engine. The next thing that we're gonna remove on the case of this engine here is this tab or bracket that used to route the engine breather. So once I've removed that tab, I'm going to reinsert the bolt and tighten it up. So we've removed the side cover, we've cut down the engine breather, we've removed this tab. We now need to remove the sprocket. When we remove the sprocket, I wanna keep the retaining plate and in order to be able to remove the sprocket, we need to put it in gear to stop the crankcase or the sprocket from turning. So I'm gonna grab the shifter that came probably in the engine kit and place it into gear. This is gonna stop the sprocket from turning. I can now undo the retaining bolts and remove the sprocket. We've removed the rear sprocket from the engine. We kept the retaining plate. This is gonna be one of the only pieces that you need to modify. So, the retaining plate that we've kept off the side of the engine, in order to use this for its next task, we need to take this over to the vise, and we are gonna cut both the sides off this retaining clip and file it and clean it up. Let's jump over to the vise and get this ready. We're now ready to cut the sides off our retaining bracket. At the same time that we're here, when we're finished, we're also gonna do a bit of work with, on our uh, shift lever. So, retaining bracket first, retaining bracket into the vise. We're just gonna use a simple hacksaw and I'm just cutting through the edge of the wing and through the edge of the hole and then I'm gonna clean it up with a file. Flip it over, do the same on the other side. I've cut the two sides off and now I wanna file it round. File the other side round. While we're at the vise, we're also gonna cut down our shift lever. So, we're gonna retain the whole, this whole part of the shift lever and right here where the weld is, 
For the actual shift part, we are going to cut this through. We've now cut down our shift lever. I'm just going to round over these ed edges and knock the corners off. Our shift lever is now ready for later on when we're actually going to weld the shift handle that's included in the kit. Importantly, we've cut the end off, rounded the corners, and got rid of any of those sharp edges. We're now on to assembling the rest of the motor. We now want to fit the sprocket to the side of the engine. In order to do that, we're going to take our modified retainer and place that on first. Included in the kit, we have two shims for adjustment, the sprocket and the spring clip. Both shims may not be necessary. On this particular engine, we've already tried it, and we know that one shim fits fine. We're then gonna fit the sprocket and the C-clip. So we've fitted our sprocket retainer, one shim, our 10 tooth 428 sprocket that comes in the kit, and the circlip. It's important to note that when all of these are fitted that the sprocket is retained nice and tight, and that the circlip sits properly in its groove. This needs to be the case so that when you run the heavy duty RK chain that is also supplied in our kit, that it doesn't dig into the engine casing. It's now time to fit our carburetor and intake manifold. And in order to do this, we're gonna need a couple of pieces that are supplied in our Revive Cart Kit. The first of that is gonna be our intake manifold adapter, some low head M6 by 18 millimeter socket head bolts, some regular M6 by 18 millimeter socket head bolts. We're also gonna use some liquid gasket maker. Uh, let's get that fitted up. It's worth noting that this carburetor adapter is gonna to need to be used in order to mount our intake manifold in the straight ahead position. If we were to not use the intake manifold adapter, our intake manifold would be kicked off to the side and our carburetor would be facing forward but on an angle. So we're going to remove the protective cover from the intake. We're then gonna use a rag and a solvent in order to remove the sticky residue. Okay, our intake port is nice and clean. There's no sticky residue left on it. I'm going to grab our uh, carburetor spacer or intake manifold adapter, flip it over. There's normally a spot where an O-ring can fit. We don't recommend using an O-ring is we've found over time and generally not that long, the O-ring ends up dying. So. We're gonna use some of our liquid gasket maker. We're gonna fill that O-ring groove and sit that over our intake port. We now wanna put our intake manifold adapter onto our intake port. It's worth noting that there's a small notch in the front of the intake manifold adapter. That notch is gonna to face towards the front of the motor. As I do this, I wanna line up the two recessed bolt holes with the two bolt holes in the top of the intake port. Okay, I've lightly set that in place. I wanna take our M6 low head by 18 millimeter long socket head bolts, and I wanna lightly screw those in from the top.
It's worth noting that I've lightly tightened the two M6 bolts, low head bolts, into the intake manifold adapter. At this point, I'm going to clean out the excess uh, gasket maker on the inside. I'm going to also let this dry or set for the next couple of hours. We're then going to come back, remove these two bolts, lock tight them, and reinstall them. So let's remove that excess gasket maker and then give it a chance to set. Three hours has now passed. Our liquid gasket maker has set. We now want to, one at a time, back out our M6 low head bolts, lock tight them with some 263, and reinstall them. It's really important that you do this due to the vibration. These have a bad habit of coming loose if they're not lock tighted. Place an ample amount or a decent amount of Loctite on the thread of your M6 low head bolts and reinstall them one at a time. We've now Loctited our two M6 bolts want to tighten those down, being careful not to over tighten them. If you were to snap them, that's going to be a, a rough day. The next thing we want to fit is the supplied gasket that comes with your engine. This will sit over the top of the intake manifold adapter. We then want to fit our intake manifold again that came along with your engine over the top of the gasket and using the two M6 socket head by 18 millimeter long uh, bolts, we're going to attach the intake manifold to the intake manifold adapter. I've snugged down my two M6 bolts, making sure that my intake manifold is pointing in the right direction. One at a time, I'm gonna remove these bolts, lock tight them and reinstall them. We've installed our intake manifold adapter that has been uh, supplied in our Revive Cart Kit. We've also installed the intake manifold that came along with the engine. You're now ready to install your chosen carburetor. We have chosen to fit a 24 millimeter PWK carburetor, mainly because of the size and we thought it was really pretty. It's got lovely colors. In order to fit this carburetor, we are gonna need an adapter in the form of this adapter just here. We're gonna bolt on this adapter to the intake manifold with two M6 by 18 millimeter socket head bolts. It's worth noting when I fitted this intake manifold adapter or carburetor adapter to go from our carburetor to our intake manifold. I haven't used the gasket or any liquid gasket maker as this adapter had an O-ring on the rear of it, so therefore no gasket was needed. I'm gonna take our carburetor and insert it. Ooh, such. Make sure it's vertical, level, straight, which it is. 
and steal a flat blade screwdriver off Nick. Awesome. We're going to tighten up that carburetor. Okay, we have our carburetor fitted to our engine using our carburetor to intake manifold adapter. You could purchase an air filter like such and fit it. In the case of this engine, because it's going on our pro card and we want it to look full baller, we are gonna fit an intake horn like this. These usually come with three set screws in order to hold them on. In the case of this one, so it doesn't rattle loose, we're actually going to epoxy it in place. That way it can never come off. Okay, we're waiting for the epoxy to dry that we've used to glue this intake horn onto the carburetor. We've only done this because of the amount of vibrations with these engines. We could have used the set screws that were provided with the intake horn, but we've found that eventually they're gonna vibrate loose even when loctited. So a bit of epoxy on there, that is permanently fixed. A lot of people out there are gonna think, okay, we've got no filter on this intake horn. Now it actually comes with a small filter element that has some metal gauze in the back and a filter at the front. And then this is going to clip on over the front of our intake horn once it's dry. The next thing on our list to do is all of these engines will have oil in them. Now it's only packing oil or oil that is in the engine for it to be shipped. We don't recommend ever using this oil to run the engines in as we've got no idea what it is. So we want to flip up this engine. We're going to have a look underneath it, have a look at where the oil drain bung is and what, where it needs to be undone and also what is commonly mistaken as the oil drain and what you don't want to undo. So we flip the engine up now. We can have a look underneath. There's really only what looks like two drain points. People often think that there's two separate oil compartments. It's not the case. There's one major uh, bung here, you could say, that can be removed. And there's also a second off to this side. The smaller of the two is actually the gear shift detent. Don't ever undo this one as there's a large spring and a ball bearing behind this that come flying out. So. In the case of this engine, we want to undo this main sump plug and drain the oil out. We're going to do that now. We've drained out the packing oil that was in the engine. We obviously have to fill it up with some oil. Because these are a brand new engine, we highly recommend a mineral-based running in oil. At the same time, we also, once, it's, once the engine is run in, recommend a decent synthetic four-stroke motorbike racing oil. So, I'm gonna put this oil down. We're gonna fill this up with the running in oil. Most of the motors, as you can see, probably on this one, will actually tell you how much oil needs to be in the engine. This one says 800 milliliters. Now, when you remove the oil fill, it actually has a measuring dipstick on it. like such. So, we're gonna fill the oil up on this, check it on the dipstick, and then we know it's good to go. Now that we've filled up the oil, it's important that we're gonna check it. When you check it, we need to make sure the engine's sitting nice and level. At the moment, I have the front packed up with a piece of cardboard. The intake manifold adapter that we've bolted onto the top of the head at that point, if that is level, the rest of the engine is also level. So screw in our dipstick. And we're two thirds the way up the indicator, so we're good to go. So the last thing that we want to do in order to get our engine ready for assembly is fit the engine tensioners. Now it's important to fit the engine tensioners now before the engine goes into the frame. 
Otherwise, these are near on impossible to fit later on. So, in order to fit the engine tensioners, which come in the kit, you're gonna need 160 millimeter long M8 hex headed bolt, your two engine tensioners, an eight millimeter ID washer, the 10 millimeter coupler or joiner nut, and an M8 nylock nut. The first thing I wanna do is place my M8 by 160 millimeter long bolt through my heim joint. Then I'm gonna place a washer on. I'm then gonna place that through this top mount on the engine. Now on the other side as a spacer, we're placing the 10 millimeter coupler or joiner nut. We're then placing the other engine tensioner, like that. The last thing we need to do is place the M8 nylock nut on the end. Now, even though we're using a nylock nut, which is gonna stay relatively tight, on this particular thread, I always apply Loctite anyway, just to keep it tight, as the motors do vibrate quite a fair bit. We've placed our M8 hex header bolt through a heim joint, through the washer, through the top mount in the engine. We have our 10 mil coupler nut, our second tensioner, and we're now gonna put our M8 nylock nut on, and we've applied some Loctite. Okay, it's important when you tighten up this top engine tensioner bolt that it is pretty firm. So I'm gonna give that a bit of an extra lean on and make sure it's nice and tight. If we have a bit of a look at this now, this is our completed engine assembly ready to be fitted to our revived drift cart. Now this would be the same for either our basic cart kit or our pro cart kit. So, to recap what we've covered, we've removed the side rear cover, removed the bracket that sits and uh, held the bottom of the engine breather. We've placed our sprocket on with the spacers and C-clip that's provided in the kit. We've cleaned and then fitted our intake manifold adapter, placed the intake manifold on that came with the engine, fitted whatever your chosen carburetor and adapter is and filter. In the case of this one, the epoxy is still drying for the trumpet. We've also fitted our engine tensioners and the bolt to hold those in place. So we've almost finished wrapping up the assembly of this engine. Now, because this engine is going in one of our pro cart kits, our pro cart kit comes with a shift indicator that is gonna sit in the alloy dash panel. Depending on which engine you purchase, it may or may not come with a shift indicator switch. So at the rear of the engine here, you will notice that there is a rubber or plastic bung fitted to the engine. That means that this one does not have a shift switch fitted to the engine to be able to tell you what gear it's in. So I'm gonna pop out that bung and we'll look at fitting a shift switch, which I've got sitting on the table here, to this engine. It's worth noting, obviously, when I do this too, this is not necessary for the basic cart kit. It's only necessary for the pro cart kit if your engine doesn't already come with a shift switch fitted. Okay, we've removed the rubber or plastic bung from the rear of the engine. If we have a look, there is a hex-headed bolt in this case, it's a 10 mil hex. I'm gonna grab a ratchet and we're gonna undo that. When you undo this, you need to use a bit of an impact force to undo it. Otherwise, you're gonna end up turning the shift shaft inside the engine. You're just gonna basically change gears.
It's important that if the engine that you have purchased does not come with the shift switch and that you purchase the shift switch separately, that the shift switch that you get comes with both the sensor and it comes with a washer, a detented washer that is going to rub or read on the switch. So this one, switch, the detent or indicated washer and a retaining clip to hold it to the side of the engine. If you buy a shift switch and it doesn't come with this small detented washer, there'll be nothing to actually read on the side of this switch once fitted. We're now gonna fit the shift switch to the side of the engine. The first thing that I wanna place in is the small detented washer that is gonna read on the side of the shift switch. There's a couple of spare M6 by 18 millimeter long socket head bolts in the kit. We're gonna require one of these. We're also gonna Loctite it in place. It's got our Loctite. Now, this is gonna be really hard to see. So we'll probably get a zoom in. The shift detent washer that is gonna read on the side of the shift switch on the rear side of it has a small metal pin. Now, if we look in the side of the cover, there's a slight notch in the side of the shift shaft and this small metal pin on the back of the shift detent washer needs to locate in that notch on the end of the shift shaft inside the engine. We're gonna take that detented washer and locate it on the end of the shift shaft, being sure that that metal pin sits in the notch on the end of the shaft. Like such. Now I'm gonna take our M6 socket head bolt that is 18 millimeters long, placing some Loctite on it. Okay, so we've just fitted our little shift detent washer and the M6 by 18 millimeter socket head bolt that we've Loctite in there. There's no need to over tighten that as as soon as the Loctite sets, it's not going anywhere. It's really important to make sure that that pin on the washer locates with the notch on the shaft before you crank it up. The other thing I did is obviously I had a little bit of excess Loctite that dropped into the bottom of that housing and I just cleaned it out. Now, we're ready to fit our shift switch. This does have an O-ring on the back of it. We recommend putting a small bead of liquid gasket maker around this as well as having the O-ring just to help it seal as this area on the engine is wet with oil and is known to leak uh, if this O-ring is damaged at all. So small amount of liquid gasket maker around our uh, switch. Now I'm gonna place this into the engine. There's a small tab on the side of the switch that is gonna locate into a notch in the side of the engine casing. So we're gonna make sure that that tab lines up with that notch. Okay, so we've fitted our shift switch to the side of the engine with a little bit of liquid gasket maker. The next thing I wanna do is use another one of the M6 by 18 millimeter long socket head bolts and the retaining bracket that is included in the kit. This is going to bolt to the side of the engine and hold the shift switch in place. Now. When I place the M6 bolt in, I'm gonna place some Loctite on it to stop it from vibrating loose. Okay, we've fitted our shift switch and detent washer to the side of the engine, so we now be able to read where the shift position is on the engine. It does have a small rubber grommet on the end that is not necessary. You could leave it there, or in the case of this engine, we don't need it, so I'm just gonna cut it off. So that's it. 
we've assembled our complete 140cc electric start manual engine. This one in particular is ready to be fitted to our pro kart chassis. Stay tuned for the next video where we assemble some more of our revived drift carts. Like, comment, and subscribe, and all of that jazz. <laughs> this is the best en- No, it's not actually the best engine. Best bang for buck, manual, clutch. Actually, it's more like so for those people out there, we are currently developing a flamethrower kit for these. So it shoots some mad flames. So you're like, Woo! Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, don't go auto. Auto is boring. No auto. No bueno. Again, no bueno. <laughs> okay, next. Cut! Kyofu wa teki de ari, mikata demo aru.